Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Today's webcast, we're going to talk a little bit about an introduction to artificial intelligence. My name is Amanda Tesco, and I'm a business intelligence and analytics consultant with Thoroughgood. I've been working for Thoroughgood for a number of years on enterprise BI strategies and implementations, and I'm joining today's webcast from our Philadelphia office. I've included my email and my LinkedIn on the screen, so if you guys do have any questions after the event and you want to reach out, certainly feel free to. I'm going to start off today by just telling you a little bit about Thoroughgood. So for those of you who have not worked with us, we are an independent global professional services firm, and we specialize in business intelligence and analytics strategy solutions and services. As you can see, we've been doing this for a little over 30 years now, and we are a global company with offices in London, New York, Philadelphia, Singapore, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Bangalore, India. And we offer a full range of BI and analytics services, so that includes things like strategy and roadmaps, as well as full implementations from requirements through to implementation, training, and support. We do work with a number of blue chip customers drawing from a range of different sectors. And the sectors we most commonly work with are the consumer goods, pharma and life sciences, financial services, and insurance sectors. And we are a independent consultancy, and in that we mean that we work with a range of different technology partners, and our consultants are knowledgeable and experienced in a wide breadth of technologies, and really the way those technologies can be integrated successfully. I've listed some of our partnerships here, including back-end, front-end, and some more analytics-driven technologies. Today's session isn't going to focus on any one particular technology. We're going to talk a little bit more theoretically about AI and the interest that it's sparking in the industry at the moment. If you do have any questions about the offerings of these specific vendors and how that might pertain to some of the topics today, certainly reach out and we can do some follow-up sessions or more in-depth conversations on those. So the objectives for today's session are pretty straightforward. I'm really looking to give you an introduction to a topic that's being paid a lot of lip service at the moment. So artificial intelligence, everybody has sort of been talking about it. And the objective of this session is really to help you become a bit more fluent and comfortable with some of the basic concepts of AI. There are so many terms out there, so really helping you just to be able to talk the talk a little bit. Then I think it's important for people to understand why everybody is talking about AI right now and why it's on everyone's agendas, not in the far out future, but for this year and for next year. I think this is important because really with any hype topic, you do have some sort of zealots, but you also have quite a few naysayers. And perhaps you're one of them, or perhaps you have to convince one of them. But really understanding what's contributing to the hype and what's kind of got us here, why are we talking about it right now, I think is very helpful to equip you for some of those conversations. And then lastly, we'll discuss some of the the key things that you may want to consider as you start to think about how you integrate AI more into your organization. So we'll start today with a little bit of AI 101. Now, first of all, what do we even mean by artificial intelligence? Or is it ML or is it DM? There are so many terms used inter interchangeably, and many people are kind of putting their own definitions to them and drawing lines between what it is and what it isn't. So for today, I'll kind of defer to Miriam Webster. AI is really a bit of an umbrella term. So as you can see here, it's a branch of computer science dealing with the simulation of intelligent behavior in computers. That's actually a pretty generic definition. So for those of you who are worrying that your organization is really far behind on the AI curve and you're seeing a lot of press from your competitors talking about their strides in AI, or just keep in mind that the definition can be used pretty broadly and find some solace in knowing that that could mean very different things for different companies. But what about some of the other terms that we're kind of hearing out there? So what do we mean, for example, by machine learning? So another common term we hear aligned with AI. I think one of the key aspects about machine learning is really the computer's ability to improve its performance or learn somewhat autonomously. So yes, it needs to be fed kind of new information, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the whole concept of machine learning is that it's a continuous process that evolves the computer's understanding. Those of you who have been dealing with data for quite some time might be wondering, how is that really different from the kind of slightly less sexy, slightly more old school term of data mining? So data mining is very much about finding patterns or trends and using that to predict future behavior, but it doesn't necessarily have the same kind of self-learning component that machine learning has. Now, I will say these are kind of subtle lines between these, and, and I wouldn't be too strict about using kind of one over the other, but I think it is important to know that they are all pretty similar and that they are related. They do have some kind of differences. So, for example, you may use data mining algorithms in machine learning models to be able to help the computer find patterns and learn better. 
and machine learning models are really just a mechanism that artificial intelligence can use to be able to make some of those decisions in real time. So having just kind of a cursory understanding of those terms and how to use them, I think is pretty important. But now, what about all of these other terms? So you've probably heard people talk about all of these different items here. And we're not going to um, go into the, the definitions of every one of these in this session, but sometimes it's helpful just to see what are the words that people are saying so that you can go away and do a little bit of homework to learn a bit more about some of these different areas. We will touch on some of these concepts um, today, and I'll kind of call them out as we go through them so that you do get a sense of some of these words, but it's good to just kind of recognize some of the uh, terminology that's being used out there today. And then the last thing I'll kind of touch on in this AI 101 section is what are people talking about when they're talking about these machine learning models? and what do we mean when we say kind of training the model? And I think a, a simple way to kind of think about this is that a model is really just an engine that accepts inputs and it gives you outputs. And those inputs you could think of as something as simple as a customer clicks on an ad and the output is that a customer purchases or doesn't purchase a product. In an ideal scenario, you want to make sure that that model is optimized so that the predictions it's making are as accurate as possible. However, in order to have that model that works kind of perfectly or as close to perfectly as possible, there are some things that we have to do. We really have to kind of teach the model what it needs to know um, to be able to do these things. So a common way that people go about doing that, and this is, I'll take you through a little bit of a simplistic approach to this. People can get pretty specific about the best kind of practices for doing this, but this will give you at least kind of a cursory understanding of how you go about getting a model that can predict information in the way that you want. So you would typically start with some sort of training data set, and this data set would have uh, those inputs and those outputs in it. So it would be historic. Uh, typically you want it to have a lot of rich information and, and a good amount of history. And it would be closed loop so that you can see, for example, if a customer clicked an ad, whether or not they purchased a product or not. You want to be able to kind of make those connections. That training data set then gets fed into an algorithm. And this is where people can get a bit confused. I think an easy way to think about these algorithms, and they could be a number of different ones, but think about pretty simple regression, maybe even linear regression to make it as simple as possible. What happens is that algorithm applies that regression model to it, and the output of that is what we're calling a model. If you think back to some of your kind of basic math classes, that model you could think of as being your kind of y equals mx plus b. So when you run a linear regression, the output of it is that formula that has you know, your slope and your intercepts. You can put inputs into it and it'll give you something out of it. So if you think about the algorithm and the model kind of in those two basic concepts, it's a bit easier to kind of understand. However, those algorithms certainly don't have to be regression algorithms. There could be a number of different ones that are used there. Then once you run your inputs through that model, some value is predicted on the other side. So in the regression case, it tries to best fit it to the line, and it'll predict what the answer is. So does the customer buy it? And then that prediction gets evaluated. Either the model predicted it correctly, or the model might have predicted it incorrectly. And that could be binary, or that could be kind of a degree of error. That evaluation feeds back into the algorithm and allows you to be able to improve the process. So when people talk about training their model, it's really about teaching that model component based on past data, how you want it to be able to perform in the future. And then as you're happier with the results of the model, you have the ability to load actual data sets into it to run through the model. And this allows the kind of machine learning aspect to kind of continuously evolve. Now this is a somewhat simplistic aspect of this, but hopefully it's a pretty simple illustration of when people are talking about models and training the models, what they mean there. Now that we've talked a little bit about some of the basics of AI, I wanted to start to talk about why are we talking about AI right now? A, a tool that I like to use at times is uh, Google Trends. I don't know if anybody has used this in the past, but what it allows you to do is basically enter a term and see how the Google search traffic has changed over time for that term, thus kind of suggesting the popularity of a term. We've been talking quite a bit about artificial intelligence recently and the hype that's kind of come around it. Uh, in the last year or so. But if we look back kind of historically in time, actually, there was a bit of a peak in 2004. It's kind of fallen off a bit and then has climbed again really since about 2014. Now, the peak in 2004 could have been due to some kind of Hollywood hype. There were some movies around the time about AI, but it really did kind of slow down for a bit and has over the last 15 years started to uh, begin to kind of reclimb. 
So what I wanted to talk about in this portion is what's kind of happened in those last 15 years that's really brought back some interest in AI. The first thing that I think is important to talk about when we're thinking about why AI is so relevant right now is to think a little bit about digital transformation. And this is one of the terms on your homework list, so you can kind of cross this one off as we go through it. Digital transformation is really about using new digital capabilities to reimagine existing business processes. And what we're seeing with digital transformation is companies really reimagining all aspects of their business processes by leveraging these digital technologies. Though many large organizations have had digital aspects in their operations for some time, for example, many of us have been purchasing insurance online for years, what we're finding is that recent advances in technology have made the scope of, for digital transformation even greater. So what are some kind of examples of this? One I really like to use is Domino's. So Domino's Pizza is a pizza delivery service in the U.S., pretty popular, and they've changed their mobile ordering so that it's now seamless across all devices, which means you can start your order on a tablet and you might not finish it there. You might pick up your phone and be able to pick up in the exact same spot you left off. You could also tweet at Domino's to have them send you a pizza, which I think had that existed while I was in university, I think would have been a very dangerous, dangerous piece of technology. But it's interesting to think about Domino's because their business model has never been about technology or building apps. They've always been in the business of creating pizzas and delivering them. But because of some of these new digital technologies, they're having to rethink different aspects of their business and think about ways that they can meet the needs of the consumers and work with consumers in the way that they want to purchase things in a way that aligns with the technology options that are available. Another interesting example is Progressive. So Progressive is a car insurance in this particular example. You used to buy a car and call the car insurance company and they would get you a policy. But nowadays, or for the last a number of years, we've been able to kind of purchase those policies online. Now, everything is kind of done from a smartphone. So the insurance card that you have to show if you get pulled over by a police officer can be on your smartphone. If you get in an accident, you can log a claim right from your phone, take photos of the accident from your phone. So Progressive has really had to reimagine the way that they do some of those existing business processes. The way you file a claim is much different today than it was before. The way you even show your ID, your registration, is different from the way you used to do it before. And so digital transformation is really about organizations really reimagining their businesses. And in many ways, I think it's causing almost every company to become a bit of a technology company, or at least to have a very strong facet of it. And so why is this possible and, and what does all of this mean? Well, it's possible because more data exists to be collected. So you may have heard a bit about the Internet of Things. That's another kind of definition on our list that you can check off. So what does that mean? The Internet of Things is basically just the concept of turning everyday objects into computing devices. So making it possible to stream and collect information from new devices, things like smartwatches or sensors on shipping containers. Um, we're also seeing that because of these digital operations, there are more and more sources of data. So now we know every time somebody logs on to even start looking at buying a pizza on Domino's, for example. So we have more and more information across a number of broader use cases, usually coming from different sources, very, very large volumes now because we're getting them from every interaction that humans have with the technology, oftentimes in varied formats. And this is also probably starting to paint the picture of big data that people have been talking about for years now. You can sort of see how some of these digital transformation efforts are resulting in more and more data that exists to be collected. And then a barrier before was always, if you had all of this data, how could you store and process it as effectively as possible? And what we're seeing, you know, in addition to more data being collected is that cloud computing has really changed our ability to store and process information. Companies can do that cheaper and easier than ever now. So that means that we can store more history. We can collect all of this information and just land it somewhere, perhaps in a data lake in the cloud, and see if we need to use it at some point in time. So the data is now easier to store and easier to use. The other thing that we're sort of seeing is with technological advances really setting the pace here, the bottleneck has started to become the people. So if your organization has been talking about new methodologies to be able to keep up with the pace, that kind of falls in line with this here. We're seeing recent shifts towards things like Agile to develop things quicker, DevOps to be able to make some of the changes more continuous, 
continuous integration, experimentation, all of these things in many ways are just responses to the need for data-focused projects to be able to stay in step with the fast pace of evolving technologies in order to really optimize the advantage that their businesses can gain from the information. So with digital transformation, the IDC is predicting the spend for digital transformation will reach $1.2 trillion by 2022, with a compound annual growth rate of 16% over the next four years. Why does this cause us to think about AI? What is the kind of relationship between digital transformation and AI? Processing all of this information by hand, it becomes impossible. Even finding meaning in it using existing reporting systems might become impossible. And so it's really caused us to have to think, how can we automate more of these things? How can we push more of these to the power of computers? If you think about AI and what we need for it to really flourish, well, we need to have the technical capability. We need the data, we need the tools, the processing power, all of those aspects that we've just talked about in digital transformation. And we're seeing that happen. We're seeing advances in infotech that are allowing us to do more and more of these things. On the other side, we also need to understand how to have computers function more like humans by really understanding more about the human brain. And what we've also been seeing is a rise in the understanding of how the brain works. This notion is something that was highlighted by uh, Yuval Noah Harari uh, in his most recent book. And so I'll just take a quick aside. Now, many of you are probably already familiar with Yuval Noah Harari. He's a historian and an author. I'd say he's most famous for his book, Sapiens, which it seemed like every person kind of on the train was reading at one point a year or so ago. His most recent book is 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And in this book, he takes a more kind of current and forward-looking view and focuses on artificial intelligence. And I've pulled a few key points here from chapter two of that book, and chapter two is called On the Future of Work. I think they're kind of quite relevant to the conversation we're having here. So the first point I have is that humans have two types of abilities, physical and cognitive. Now, to date, machines have really kind of taken over many capabilities of humans that were physical. So if we think about the Industrial Revolution, for example, everybody was afraid that machines would replace human jobs, but really what machines did was just replace some of the physical aspects of human jobs. So if you think about an assembly line, for example, taking over physically putting the parts together. But what about the cognitive side? So learning, analyzing, understanding human emotion, being able to communicate. It's been felt, you know, that that is something that is kind of uniquely the domain of humans and that that's kind of what separates man from machine. Another point that he sort of makes is that that human intuition that, that has been so vaunted is really just kind of pattern recognition. So developments in technology are really kind of coming together with developments in biotechnology. And what that kind of means is that what was once thought to be kind of uniquely human intuition is based on interactions between billions of neurons responding to our senses. And what was kind of uniquely human is in fact partly doable by machines. And I think the implications of this are, you know, not only that machines could do things like take over our driving for us, but they could also play the roles of things that are a bit more creative as well. And then the last point that he kind of makes in that chapter, or the last one I've, I've pulled out here at least, is that in addition to machines kind of being able to replicate some of those patterns of recognition that exist in the human brain, there are also a couple of non-human abilities that computers can possess that humans can't, and that is connectivity and updatability. So if you think about the way doctors learn, for example, in our society, if a doctor learns something new, in order to be able to get every other doctor to understand that advancement, it takes getting it into, you know, your medical schools, doing different publications on it, making sure the doctors are reading it. The ability to kind of network all of the doctors together and update them is not as effective as you could do it with computers. So the ability to network computers together and have them update at the same time gives a little bit of an advantage over that. If you can understand enough about the human brain to effectively hack it, and the technology can support the amount of information and processing that needs to happen, you begin to be able to create some pretty powerful computers. This can seem maybe a bit far-reaching um, or futuristic, but how many of us talk to Alexa each morning to know what the weather will be 
or get lured by a recommendation on Amazon. The thing I've been doing most recently is I keep finding my new favorite song from playlists that Apple Music created for me based on anything I've listened to um, basically since 2006 when I think I got iTunes. So the confluence of infotech and biotech are really making some of these things possibilities. So how does that kind of translate back to your data and analytics and the initiatives of businesses and industries across the world right now. It's motivating C-suites everywhere to really bring analytics, AI, and data into the fold. And why are they doing that? Well, sure, there's the lure of opportunity, but even more so is the risk of irrelevancy. So if competitors are reimagining their business and using these digital performance kind of enhancers, what happens to those who aren't doing it? It's a real fear that many companies have right now, and what we're finding is it's leading to a lot of the buzz around AI because there is a worry about being left out. But it's also leading to a little bit of a, a common challenge that we're seeing. What we're seeing is that there's more and more interest and drive coming from the board level for these types of initiatives. There's a directive to move and for companies to move very quickly and encouraging those they direct to do a lot for a little bit. So you've got to experiment because you don't want a big disaster, but you've got to do something because you can't be seen to fall behind. There's also a push to invest in anything that can be kind of classified as new age, so AI. And that's why I mentioned about the, the vagueness of the definition of AI, but also machine learning, chatbots, anything you might put under that umbrella. And oftentimes this drive is sort of to the exclusion of some of the foundational pieces. So how can you do AI if you have no data? You can't. But even worse, what happens if you have bad data and you're doing AI on top of it? That could cause some, some significant issues. And then what we're finding is that on the ground, you have teams working out how to make it happen. So do you use the cloud? Do you have to be more agile? Is it DevOps that we need? Though the boardroom interest is good, there is, seems to be a bit of a kind of a growing disconnect between what's being asked for and what is practical. And working out kind of how you bridge that gap is something that's been made quite difficult and, and probably isn't helped by some of the vendor messaging saying you can do everything and some of the strategy consultants saying you need to do these very high level things without quite understanding the, the foundational pieces that need to be in place to make those things happen. And so how do you bridge the gap? Well, we've put together just a couple of considerations to get you to start thinking about the sorts of conversations that you'll need to have in your organization to make sure that you're rooting some of these initiatives in real value to the business, but in practicality as well. So the first thing is really to focus on the business. There's no sense in doing AI for AI's sake. You need to know what you're trying to solve, and it needs to be valuable. I've got a quote here from the VPA Digital Development at Lowe's. Lowe's is actually is a, a store in the U.S. that sells home improvement products and is doing quite a bit at the moment with AI. They've got bots in the store that are helping direct customers to products, and they're also using computer visioning, which is another term on your kind of keyword list. But what that does is allows the computer to watch digital images or video and identify where, in this instance, there are empty spaces on the shelves at the store so that it can automatically notify one of the workers to replenish the stock. So they're doing quite a bit in this space. And I thought this quote was good because he says, we never set out to leverage AI. The technology doesn't drive the solution. The problem drives the solution. And AI technology is just a way to solve it. So I think you've got to really think about the directive can't be, we have to do more AI. The directive has to be, we have a problem that we need to solve, and AI might be a reasonable solution for solving it. The next is really an, an important one that I'm sure many can kind of relate to. You do need to get your data in order. As I said, there's no AI without data, and AI with bad data is a disaster. But if you really want an advantage in the marketplace, you've got to think about the types of things that will make your data give you an advantage. Is it good quality? Is it conformed, so not in disparate places where it can't be aligned together, but a place where it can be sensible to algorithms as you feed it into it? Is it stored efficiently, so cost efficiently, but also in a way that it can be retrieved easily? Is it strongly attributed, so if you're running regression models on something that only has two attributes, you're certainly not going to have real rich analyses or real rich prediction models coming out of it. So I think there's a lot of focus that still has to happen on data to make sure that everything you have is going to work for this new AI initiative. And also recognizing that 
as data becomes easier to obtain and collect, everybody is going to be having it. So what sort of data do you need that would really help you have a competitive advantage? The next one is really be prepared to discuss morality, privacy, and legality. So I've got a, an example on the screen there just of a, a clip from GDPR, which is a data privacy regulation that starts to limit the extent to which you can use AI for certain types of processes that include personal information. But there are other considerations as well, such as in the approval of loans, how do you make sure that you're not kind of discriminating, that your algorithms aren't discriminating unfairly? or resume scoring? Are you magnifying kind of any biases there? So are you only going to hire people similar to the people you've hired in the past? Is that going to make the problem kind of exacerbated? So there's a lot of consideration that has to be given in any initiative to some of these aspects of it. And then lastly, I would say is just don't underestimate the cultural shift. So is your organization structure correct to handle it? And if it's not, how do you augment it to get it there? Do you have the capabilities within your organization to be able to enable these sorts of things? The combination of technology, statistics, and business is not one that exists in many people in the workforce today. The estimates of the number of kind of effective data scientists who have all of those things globally is quite low. So how do you create an organization that creates those types of people, that retains them, that attracts them? Those are all considerations that have to go into this. And then trust and transparency as well. So do you have an organization that will trust an algorithm? How do you make it as transparent as possible without kind of dumbing it down? So that will wrap up kind of the key considerations for today. Thank you all for joining today. As I said, my name is Amanda, and I've listed my information there. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions about some of the high-level topics we covered today, or if you have some suggestions for more in-depth topics that you might be interested for us to cover in future sessions.